Welcome to the Australian Hiker Podcast, Australia's longest running hiking podcast, downloaded over half a million times in over 145 countries and providing you with an Australian perspective on all things hiking. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 210 of the Australian Hiker Podcast. And in this week's episode, we talk about food on the trail, a detailed look. Before we get into today's episode, if you'd like to help support Australian Hiker and this podcast, there are a couple of ways that you can help us out. Firstly, by subscribing on your podcast host of choice so that each episode is available as soon as it's published. And if you have the opportunity, leave us a five-star review. Another way to support us is go to the Australian Hiker website at www.australianhiker.com.au and click on the supporters page and buy us a coffee. You can do a one-off donation or become a monthly supporter. All donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue producing this podcast and blog. Now let's get on to today's episode. When overnight camping, you have lots of additional things to consider. Where to camp, when to camp, where to go to the toilet, and what to eat are just some of them. Once you start doing multi-day or even multi-week hikes, these considerations will often tend to multiply. Food is a big consideration in this planning process because it requires you to plan ahead and really think about what you may think you want to eat in a number of days, if not weeks, in advance. In this podcast episode, we discuss food requirements for multi-day and multi-week hikes that can also be used for shorter hikes. We hope you enjoy. So what I'd recommend to get the best out of this podcast episode is go to the show notes for episode 210 and there's a link to the seven day meal list. It's PDF. And if you open that up uh, and that'll give you, give you a good indication of what we're talking about in this episode. One thing that I would really say here uh, in relation to uh, providing this list, we'd had people asked us to provide a, a detailed list for the last couple of years and for one reason or the other, we'd never gotten around to it. So after the last trip we did, where someone asked us about what we, they recommended or what we recommended for food, we decided it was time to produce this episode. Now, this spreadsheet is, that forms part of this episode is based on a seven-day hike. And for longer hikes, I just tend to repeat uh, that list over and over again. The other thing to highlight is that that's for Tim... Uh, in a single day, and uh, it's not necessarily going to be the case that we double that uh, when we're hiking together. So again, we're talking about uh, an individual hiking, and then you just need to to make the changes for hiking as a couple. Now, my food selection on any hike is constantly evolving. I've been using some items of food uh, that are listed in my spreadsheet for years, while others change as I find new food to try. I know what I do and don't like and how much I eat on trail, so the amount of food I carry has been refined over time to the point that I now carry less than I did 10 years ago. This meal list works well for me, but it may not work for for anyone else necessarily, so we suggest using this list as a guide to build up your weekly meal plan. Everybody has different tastes, so really it's going to be what you like and it certainly may not be the things that I like. And one final comment I'd make here before we go into any detail is if you're doing long distance hikes, it's important to talk with a nutritionist so they can analyze your food and identify any shortcomings. And certainly uh, uh, I did that for my Bibbleman track trip in 2018 and that highlighted some shortfalls, uh, which was easy enough to rectify uh, before I started the hike. Hmm. And and just, I guess, something to note that if you we're talking about seven-day hikes or longer here, if you're going for shorter hikes, some of the nutritional aspects of your food probably don't matter so much. So particularly if it's a weekend, um, you you know, if you're on a usually healthy diet and uh, you don't quite get it right for a couple of days, it's probably not a problem. But uh, the longer you're hiking, the more attention you need to pay to the nutritional aspects. So let's look at the main considerations when we're going through and talking about food for the longer hikes. I think choosing food, as we mentioned, is a very personal consideration. And as I said, 
we we're making making recommendations based on what I like. But as mentioned, it may not necessarily be what anyone else and, likes. And it is what Tim likes. We eat what Tim likes. <laughs> um, once you start doing trips over multiple days, your food choices do become really important. I mean, for two or three days, you can eat exactly the same thing and it's not really going to bother you too much. Try to do that over a two or three or four week period and you're going to lose all interest in having any meals, which isn't going to help you on your hike. So what do you need to consider when developing a meal plan based on weeks rather than days? First thing I'd say is the obvious question we often get asked is commercial versus homemade. I know people, a lot of people who will prepare their own meals. Uh, they'll make meals and they'll dry them or dehydrate them at a home. I tend to be the opposite. I tend to use commercial food in, in most cases, but not all. And from my aspect, Commercial food is more expensive, whereas homemade food, you, you know, if you have a particular type of food that you can't find anywhere else and you, you're a reasonable cook, you can make it and dehydrate it and know what it's going to taste like when you, when you have it on the trail. You can also cook on the trail. That gives you more versatility. But you do need to be aware that in some countries or in some states and territories in Australia, they do limit the types of food or uh, fruit and vegetables in particular that you can bring into the state. Uh, so you want to be very careful before you get too carried away with home preparing a lot of meals, only to have it confiscated when you, you land at an airport. So check that first. From my perspective, time is probably my most valuable commodity. Uh, so I don't mind spending a bit of extra money and getting commercial food. It also means when I do travel interstate, particularly to those states that limit the importation of fruit and vegetables, I don't have to worry about losing it at the other end. From here, the comment I'd make is how flexible are you? Now, I'm not the sort of person who can just walk into a supermarket and grab stuff off the shelves and go. Uh, particularly from a hiking perspective, I tend to be a fairly fussy sort of eater uh, and I know what I do like. Uh, and I'm not game to necessarily just pick something off off the shelf on the off chance that I might like it. Uh, I need to get out bush and find out that I don't. So again, this is a good enough reason for me is to use food that I know that I, uh, and like, and also that I can easily find if I need to. So in most cases, I will post through mail drops my food ahead or like the human hovel trap that we did a couple of years ago, we cached. So I sent one, I mailed one box ahead and I actually went through and cached, which was basically hiding a well-sealed plastic container in the middle of nowhere that I could collect up my food uh, as we walked past. Which resupply options you use are really going to be up to you. And we do have a whole separate article and a podcast on resupply options for hiking as well. Now, how much food should you carry? And this is going to be one of the hard things that's uh, not something you can just magically decide on and, and uh, are likely to get it right. It's something you need to work on and keep records of to work out how much food you actually need. In most cases, I will carry roughly seven to ten days worth of food on a hike. Uh, the, the heaviest or the biggest food carry that I've ever done is 12 days. Um, that's a lot of food. That's a lot of food. <laughs> Uh, I usually don't like carrying any more than about 22 kilos in my pack, and that includes water for the day as well. And I, ma I did manage to, to do that for this 12-day 12 uh, 12 food carry, but there is a limit to how much food you can physically carry. The old traditional uh, view on food for hiking is two pounds, which is roughly about 900 grams of food per person per day. Now, my typical food allotment, uh, that's what I started off with many years ago, just as a guide. Uh, my current food carry uh, as a daily average is 709 grams dry weight. Uh, so when, you, when I'm carrying dehydrated food or freeze-dry food and I add water to it, it certainly weighs, weighs much more than that when I eat it. But that's certainly a good indication. And when we carry food for both of us, um, I usually don't carry another 700 grams. So, you know, I think um, when we're doing for both of us, it comes in at about uh, 1.2 to 1.3 kilos a day for the two of us. 
And there are certainly uh, advantages to, to travelling as a couple. Because I carry your food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. I get the extra weight. But, you know, in a lot of cases, my freeze-dried meals, they might be 90, 100, 110 grams for a single serve, whereas for a twin serve, they could be up to 180 grams. So um, you know, a twin serve, which is, is more than enough food for both of us, doesn't tend to weigh as, as twice as much as a single serve. Uh, and Jill has different tastes than I do. Uh, so, again, we, we tend to, not, not as Jill mentioned, carry twice the weight of food just because there's two people. I think one of the things I would say here is without fail, on your first long-distance hike, you are going to carry way too much food. And a good example here, when our first long-distance hike where we carried everything or carried the food rather than having meals provided for us, uh, which was the Larapenta Trail, we found that there were food drops that were done along the way uh, at the various at the various day picnic areas. And when we'd get there to pick up our food allotment out of its, its container, there was all this leftover food that people had left there because they, had, they didn't want it and they didn't use it. So rather than carrying it, they just left it there to, to be thrown out or, or in a lot of cases to be used by other people. Mm. Uh, and some people who had undercated or had extended their trip, managed to feed themselves out of what was left over. Yeah, but even in uh, what we did, um, you know, we would get everything out and shuffle what we had left and look at what was new and there was still a lot of food that we uh, left behind in the bin uh, and walked on. I think one of the things I've done, I for, for every one of my larger trips, you know, longer than a week or so, uh, I've kept records, uh, spreadsheets going back a number of years, so I can look at what I ate three or four years ago, look at what I'm eating now, and certainly the, the weight of the food that I'm carrying is smaller. Um, and the, and in, in the case of Bibbleman Track, what I ended up doing when, when I picked up my food from the post office, um, I came back, packed my bag, reshuffled out, got rid of any extras that I didn't need and sent it back home again. So when I got back home, I could weigh what I'd sent back and work out what my average food carry for the, the duration of that five-week trip was. So that certainly uh, made a difference to be able to slowly and progressively whittle my food down. Weight's just one aspect of food, and the other one is calories. Now, for most of us in a normal day-to-day -day living, for a male, the recommendation is roughly around about 8,700 kilojoules. On an average hiking day, when I walk around about 13 to 25 kilometres, so I'll burn around about 5,000 calories. So it's really almost physically impossible to carry that amount of food and eat it. While I might be able to carry less days worth of food, um, I just find that I'd become bored and I just physically can't eat that much food. There is a, a situation that mainly affects endurance athletes, and I don't class myself as that, but when you're doing big distances and hiking, you really are doing an endurance event uh, where you lose appetite. So for me, the more I exercise, the, the less appetite that I have. So I have to force myself to eat at the end of the day. Uh, so on a typical one week long hike, I'll lose three to three and a half kilos and I'll do that week in, week out. Yeah, for me, I, I just get bored. I get bored with food. Um, and I find that it's hard to carry the variety that will keep me interest, interested. So on an average day hike, I will carry 2,900 calories worth of food, which is just over 12,100 kilojoules. And, and as I said, I've just got that, that 2,100 calorie deficit uh, between what I burn and what I carry, which is hence why I'm losing, losing that amount of weight per week. I've yet to work out what my maximum amount of hiking potentially is because there's a limit to how many three, three and a half kilo weeks worth of weight loss that I can lose. But certainly uh, uh, five weeks, uh, the Bibbleman track, I lost 15 kilos. From a female perspective, females tend to be a lot more efficient in their calorie usage. So women will still lose weight on long distance hikes, but they don't tend to lose the same amount of weight that uh, men do or at the rapid, as rapidly as men do, uh, but they'll tend to tone up. Uh, but certainly from a male perspective, 
looking at the US long trails, you see people have been hiking for three, four, five months and they some of them end up looking like scarecrows by the end of it. Yeah, so, um, you know, if Tim's, Tim's up around the six or 7,000 um, calorie usage, I'm probably still around two and a half to three. <laughs> I'm very efficient. I think that means that you need me when the famine is around, don't you? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Now, for long-distance hikes, what you're trying to look at is food with lots of calories. So when we're at home living our normal life, we tend to be conscious of how many calories we're eating, even if we don't count them. But when you're hiking and doing long-distance hiking, uh, it really is go for it, eat as much as you can, as high calories as you can. So things like nuts uh, and nut butter, so peanut butter and Nutella and things like that, are really good food for hiking that have loads of calories. Uh, it's so easy to carry, you know, carrying lettuce on a hike, apart from the fact that it's not going to last terribly well, there's not many calories in it, so you're not going to survive, even if you've got fresh loads of lettuce every day, it's just you're not going to last. So you need foods with high calorie content. Taste and texture is also important. Now, Jill mentioned that from her perspective, she gets bored with food over a period of time, as do I. So if you carry just... As an example here, uh, when I carry a hike, and we'll talk about the specifics in a moment, if I carry nuts, I don't just carry macadamia nuts, which are my favourite. I'll carry macadamias, I'll carry pecans, I'll carry pistachios, I'll carry almonds. Uh, I don't carry walnuts. I love walnuts, but I just don't like them on a hike. So I, I carry different types of food, even though they might be similar, so I don't get bored. Same with freeze-dried meals. I don't just carry the same freeze-dried meal for dinner every night. I carry. Uh, I normally work uh, on around about six or seven different meals a week. Um, it varies, and it it often varies on the time of the year. Some sometimes I'll I'll vary the food I eat in winter time compared to summer, just because of the the temperatures. Um, but certainly having that variety in there means you don't tend to get bored with your food, and you will eat your food. I think as in a couple of examples through here, there are some things if I go back four or five years that I'm still carrying today. So things like the sesame snaps, which is basically compressed sesame seeds with with honey pretty much. (laughs) Um, I have always eaten those. I normally allow one little mini packet per day for all my hikes. And even after a, a hike of five weeks, I don't get bored. I always look forward to them in the mornings. Processed cheese sticks. I will always carry those on hikes and have done for a number of years. I don't get bored with them. Nuts, I vary the nuts, but I I will always carry them. I just don't get bored. One thing I don't eat that I used to eat a number of years ago is the jerkies, the beef jerky and uh, uh, various types of jerky. I love jerky. I will eat it when I'm at home, but I tend not to eat it on hikes because I find that I'll eat it for the first two or three days get bored with it for about a week and then go back to it again. And it's just not worth carrying it uh, just on the off chance that I might decide I like it a week later. It's all that chewing, I think. Is- I th- yeah, <laughs> I think it's the chewing and the, and the moisture you create. So it's just one of those sort of things. So taste and textures are fairly important. Uh, having something that's crunchy or having something that's soft uh, or sugary, having something that's salty, all the different tastes and textures uh, means you're less likely to get bored with your food. I think we're starting to sound like MasterChef here too. Yeah. It was it umami. Umami, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is, I don't know. <laughs> I, I never, now, food selection for me is an ever-evolving ever evolving process. So the foods I take on the hike, um, as I said, there's a, a batch that will I, I can look back five years and it hasn't changed and other things have. So it's not the sort of thing that I, I do tend to buy stuff that is readily available. I don't like buying things that you've got to struggle to find. And again, I, I like I know what I like and I know what I like to eat. Now, going more into details, if you go through and have a look at the spreadsheet uh, associated with this podcast or the written version of this podcast, this is my food that I use for Uh, a seven-day hike. And as I mentioned, I go through and just rotate this through week in and week out. So if I'm doing two weeks, it's two lots of these spreadsheets. Three weeks, I just multiply it by three. 
One thing you'll notice if you have looked through here, um, the calorie carrying per day is different and the calories per day are different. Now, what happens here is each of my daily food rations go into a Ziploc bag. Uh, and in fact, people often have often say that I shouldn't be using lip Ziploc bags. Some of my Ziploc bags are four years old. Some of them are new, uh, and I don't just use them and throw them away. They get recycled and get used for a period of years, providing they're still in good condition. So it's worthwhile buying good quality Ziploc bags rather than the cheaper ones. I will tend to work on a set of meals slash snacks each day. So I have breakfast, I have lunch, and I have dinner. That's pretty standard. Uh, I have a set of snacks that allows me to eat every hour. So I eat small amounts of food every hour. So all as, almost without fail here, the sesame snaps are my first snack of the day. I think it's probably the thing I most look forward to. Uh, and, you know, and that's about an hour to an hour and a half after I started. That's the first thing I'll tend to eat. I'll carry dried fruit. Uh, now the dried fruit, I vary between pineapple, mango, bananas, and I just rotate that through. Other snacks I look at are things like Dutch licorice. That's the slightly salted licorice. But I also have something that's new to me in my, my snack of choice is the butter and ginger bears. They're just a little gummy uh, ginger gummy, which I quite like. Yeah, they don't do much for me. <laughs> I also carry the, the Cliff Shot Blocks. Now, I wouldn't class those as a snack. They're an energy hit. If I'm finding I'm starting to flag, particularly in the afternoon, that packet will last me a couple of days. Yeah, they're probably a little bit dangerous because they are calorie packed, they're small, and they're very tasty. So as I said, I'll be eating on almost every hour, uh, and I found I found a few years ago every. It's only been twice in the last five or so years where I've forgotten to eat. Uh, I've just been so focused on what I'm doing. I didn't eat, and all of a sudden I hit a wall, which is also known as bonking, and I just you know, I just all of a sudden I just grind to a halt. So Who decided that was bonking. I mean, uh, it's, really, it's yeah. an American term. Okay. So it's the sort of thing that I I do have to consciously remember. I need to have a piece of dried fruit. I need to have some nuts. I need to have a sesame snap or something every hour. Lunchtime for me will vary. Um, it used to be processed cheese. Now I've gone for the campus pantry freeze-dried cheese. Uh, it's a bit tastier. It's lighter and, again, loads of calories, and I can normally clean that up in a couple of days. It also lasts better, particularly in the, in the hot weather. Lunch will normally consist of flatbread and either uh, the, the freeze-dried cheese, uh, the dips, either black bean or hummus, uh, or peanut butter. Uh, and it's not unusual for me just to get a jar of peanut butter out, get a spoon, eat a number of spoons, and that's my lunch. It's just easy. Now, those days where I've got, I normally carry a 470 gram jar of peanut butter uh, for a week, and that just happens to go into one of the meal packs. So even though in the, if you look at the the spreadsheet, the PDF, uh, I think the peanut butter is actually shows up in day four. But then I, when I mention the peanut butter and later on, I don't add the weight because the weight's already been, been included in another, another day. So the day that I carry the peanut butter jar, that food pack is, one, is over one kilo. But again, as I said, when you average it out, uh, I'm averaging out to 709 grams of food per, uh, per day. And that, weigh, that weighs up to around about 5.7 kilos of food for a seven-day period. The other meal I tend to throw in there is, uh, cl I've classed it as pre-dinner. And uh, if you talk to most nutritionists, most people who go to the gym, once you've exercised, you're supposed to have a protein snack uh, within around about 20 minutes of half an hour after finishing your exercise. So for me, I get into camp, uh, providing it's not pouring with rain. One of the first things I do, I have a sustagen and whole milk powder drink, which is high in protein. And that's my drink that I'll have prior to dinner. Uh, and then I'll get my tent set up and get organized for the night uh, and then make dinner, which might be an hour, hour and a half later, depending on what I'm doing. And then we've got dinner thrown in there as well. And dinner consists of a freeze-dried meal. 
a hot chocolate at the end of the meal or with the meal, usually not carry or have desserts when I'm hiking by myself. That's something I tend to save for when there's two of us hiking. So, and the last thing to mention is um, uh, is breakfast. Now, breakfast for me tend to be a mixture of uh, things like wheat bix or uh, special K. On the days that I have cereals, I'll have a what's what's called a Belveda breakfast biscuit, which is a large, soft, chewy sort of biscuit. Uh, on the other days, I'll have overnight oats, uh, which tends to be fairly high in calories. Now, having said that, things like wheat bix aren't particularly high in calories. So, from a calorie perspective, it's probably the poorest quality calories that I carry. But I like the taste, I like the texture, and I'm willing to sacrifice the calories just to have that. I also like having a cup of tea uh, at breakfast time. And for me, it's herbal tea. I'm not going to fiddle around by having milk at breakfast. So it's just a matter of boiling the water and having a cup of tea. And you'll also notice in there, if you have a look at this sheet, is there's a multivitamin. As I said, when I did the Bibbon track, I went to a nutritionist and got her to have a look at my food, and she said, I wouldn't want to live on this for permanently, but it, it will work well for the period you're looking at. Uh, it's a bit low on micronutrients, so she recommended a multivitamin. Uh, so that's the reason for me carrying that. Okay, so as a final thought... Food choices, as mentioned, are very much a personal thing. What you choose to eat on a hike is going to be different for everyone, so I don't claim that this is going to suit, that what I've identified as being my meal or food plan is going to be suitable for everyone. And there's also it also doesn't take into consideration uh, people have any food allergies or f- specific food requirements. And that's a bit of a challenge, I think, if particularly if you've got a nut allergy and um, most of your calories are coming, uh, most of Tim's calories are coming from nuts. <laughs> yeah, I've got things like nuts, I've got peanut butter, or I've got nut butter bars, I've got everything to do with nuts. So yeah, it, it does make it a bit harder, it's a bit more challenging. So the other thing to consider as well is that, you know, everyone will have a budget to work through. Uh, and if I, uh, as an example, a five-week food budget for the Bibbleman track, uh, I think it worked out to, from memory, ig- ignoring postage and delivery of the food, uh, it worked out to around about five to $600 over that five-week period. Um, the postage was, was uh, almost that. Was almost that. <laughs> the postage ended up that being was probably the most expensive. Yeah, part. being three hundred or three hundred odd dollars or four hundred dollars. So, uh, but again, as I said, it's it's the sort of thing where um, I couldn't just drop into a supermarket and pick up what I like. Uh, and I think, from my perspective, it's false economy going cheap on food, eating things that you don't like just because it's cheap. You won't eat it, it won't give you the calories, and it's just not going to help you on the enjoyment of your hike. So carry too little food, you'll be miserable. Carry too much food and you won't be happy because it's going to be weight on your back. And carry food that you don't like and won't eat, but you're still going to have to carry it. So you're losing both situations there. So what it comes down to is life is too short to eat bad food. Okay, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. As I said, really, it's the spreadsheet that you want to go through and look at. Use it as a base to plan your own meals uh, and decide on what you like, um, but it's a good indication. Uh, And keep records about what you're eating and what you don't eat on a hike to help refine that for your future hikes. That's all for this week. Bye for now. And bye from me. I'll only have the desserts when I'm travelling as a couple. (laughs) A couple of what? (laughs) Um, And you, but you, 